Thanks, Julia, um, and good morning. Uh, thanks for the introduction. Yes, uh, my name is Gary Gillis here. I'm with uh, GS Associates out of the Wisconsin office here in Madison. Um, do some consulting work here for agricultural producers and others and, and trying to help them identify opportunities for uh, installation of variable frequency drives and, and trying to work with producers to find some good opportunities and, and give them some good ROI information. Just a little background about myself. Um, I came from more of the technical aspect, uh, came from more of the uh, programming side of things. I was trained on VFDs and in the actual programming and feedback loop side of things and being able to do automation control. So that's kind of where I come from. Um, now I use that experience and in, in, in working with uh, primarily dairy and irrigation producers in trying to find uh, opportunities. But again, welcome. And I hope we can share some of my experiences, and I hope some some of you uh, can take some of that knowledge with you back to your office and, and put it to good use. But uh, with that said, we'll go ahead and get started here. Just a little bit of uh, uh, what I plan to discuss during the webinar here this morning, uh, give an introduction to the VFD or variable frequency drive, describe a little bit about what it is, what it does, what it can do for us. Um, and then also dig into some of the technical aspects of what happens inside of the VFD and, and give some of the electrical characteristics and, and, and what we're looking at when we, when we consider that VFD in a particular application. From there, uh, take a look at some of the different types of motor loads that we may encounter. Um, there's basically three different categories of motor loads. Uh, essentially, what's that electric motor connected to? And depending on what that motor is connected to will determine what our energy saving potentials might be. So we'll talk a little about that and then I'll go through and see, um, kind of explain where we might be able to look for potential VFD applications, uh, where are some of the better opportunities, where might not be a good opportunity, things like that. And then also I'll finish up here by, by going through an example of an energy savings opportunity on a VFD vacuum pump on a dairy farm, and then follow up with a short little case study. So just a kind of an overall introduction to the variable frequency drive. I try to, I try to equate this to something that we can all sort of, um, sort of relate to. And I always try to use the uh, driving the car, you know, using the throttle on the car. A VFD does act very similar to when we use a throttle on a car. In other words, you know, what happens when we go up a hill? What happens when we go down a hill in our vehicle? When we go up a hill, obviously, we might have to press down on the gas pedal to increase our horsepower, um, and we need more horsepower to climb the hill. When we go down a hill, we might let off the gas pedal to reduce our horsepower because we don't need quite so much power. And when we think of VFDs and different applications, it's sort of doing the same thing. We're, we're just trying to use that variable frequency drive to change the speed of our motor, electric motor, um, which in turn results in increases or decreases of power, uh, which is essentially what we're trying to do. Uh, then, you know, I often hear different terminology, but a VFD does exactly what variable frequency drive says it does. It varies the frequency supplied to three-phase motors. Uh, I often hear the term adjustable speed drive, inverters, variable speed drives. It's the same thing, um, just a different lingo or terminology used out there. Um, variable frequency drive is just kind of what I've always gone by, but you may hear it term the different term. We, they conserve energy, like I had said. Uh, they can conserve energy, like I had said, by adjusting the speed of the motor. And we're trying, what we're trying to do here is just meet the demand of a particular application. So whether, no matter what we're connected to, we just want to supply the amount of power required and no more, no less. We do offer, they can offer the greatest energy savings opportunities with pumps and fans and I will get into that in more detail 
as to why that is later in the webinar. And then it's also important to realize that uh, uh, pumps and fans and, and really any mechanical device, whether it be tied to a motor, is sized when, when, the engine, when they're engineered and sized accordingly. We have motors and applications and they're sized to meet the maximum demand. And we may not always need the maximum demand. Sometimes we might only need 50% or maybe even less than what the system's designed for. And, and I kind of equate that to think of the, the heating system in your home, for example. When it's 20 below zero, we want that furnace to be able to heat our home. And, and usually, you know, we try to size our heating systems in our homes, for example, to meet the maximum demand, which maybe it's 20, 30 below zero. Here in Wisconsin, it has been anyway. And when it's that cold, that furnace may never turn off. However, um, when it's, say, it's 40 degrees outside, we still need some heat, but we definitely don't need to be heating like it's 20 or 30 below zero. So the chances of actually getting to the point where we need our maximum damp demand is very small so you know there's going to be a lot of time in there where we don't necessarily need that maximum uh, generally speaking when we look at on the market or I'm sorry when we when we when we adjust the speeds of the motors we're looking generally speaking 20 to 100 percent speed of what the VFDs can control to uh, I've seen actually they can go all the way from zero all the way up over hundred percent rpm I've, I've actually had some applications where we may have to overspeed that motor, and these VFDs, some of them can be programmed to do that. On the market today, we do see them available and readily available. VFDs have been available in the market for many, many years now, and, and producer manufacturers have got readily available sizes all the way from 1 to 1,000 horsepower. I have seen large applications, especially I know in the oil and gas industry, uh, some of the pumping stations might have a couple thousand horsepower pumps, and I've heard, uh, never actually seen, but I have heard that uh, um, they also have variable speed drives for those units, but um, from what I gather, a lot of those are more custom-made uh, custom made designs. So that's sort of an introduction to VFDs. Uh, moving on to the next section, I just wanted to take a little bit of a break here and kind of ask, we don't all need to answer, but just I want you to think about this question here. Um, does installing a variable frequency drive automatically mean that a motor will operate more efficiently? So, you know, I often think this might be a little misconception out there, but does it always mean if we just put a VFD on a motor, is that going to mean that that motor operates more efficiently? And I'll go ahead and answer that for you if I can change the slide. And the answer is no. Um, a VFD does not enable a motor itself to operate any more efficiently. Um, what we're trying to do here is, is increase the efficiency of the ap actual application, you know, whether that's a pumping station or, or what have you. We're, we're just we're trying to get the system, the actual system, to operate more efficiently. The VFD does not enable a motor to run more efficiently. In fact, um, if we just took a standard motor, didn't change any of the parameters to reduce speed. All we did was put a VFD in line with that motor to operate that motor. We'd actually be using more energy for the simple fact that there is a little bit of loss within the VFD itself. So if we just were running a motor 100%, we put a VFD and ran it 100%, we'd have a little bit of loss. And that's due to the fact that the VFDs are typically about 95 or maybe a little bit higher efficient wise percent efficient so there's going to be a few percent loss just through the VFD operating but in general you know we're, we're looking anywhere you know in a good application uh, good energy savings upper you know application here in general I mean it's across the board but 30 to 70 percent is a good ballpark range of expected energy savings So digging a little bit more into the technical aspects here of how these things operate, uh, we've got, uh, let's see here if I can grab my laser pointer. A uh, little graph here in the upper right is kind of the well, it's electrical schematic. 
that, that details out sort of how these things are configured internally. But the key here to understand is really we have alternating current coming in on the input and that standard power coming from a utility is 60 hertz here in the U.S. Uh, I'm not sure if anyone from other European countries may be on, but theirs would be 50 hertz. Here, here in the U.S. for 60 hertz, we have standard electricity coming in. Uh, we use what's called a rectifier to take that signal, that, that standard AC signal. We break that up using a rectifier into a DC voltage. Uh, DC uh, filter actually studies that DC voltage out here. Uh, I've seen these run about 600 volt DC. So we bring whatever AC voltage in, the electronic components, they step that up to about 600 volt DC. And um, then at the tail end of this thing, we actually have um, uh, an inverter. And that inverter has some transistors in it that are controlled by, uh, there's a little computer in this uh, variable speed drive. But they essentially control the speed at which these transistors switch on and off. And what, what we get coming out of this thing is uh, what's called a pulse wave modulated signal. And we can adjust the frequency of that based with our, with our inverters. And that's the signal that we actually output to the motor. So the motor is no longer getting a standard AC sine wave that we typically see from the utility company. It is getting something different that's coming out of this variable frequency drive. So that's, that's how they work inside. Where do we find them used? Uh, you know, there are many, many different applications, industrial, commercial, agricultural applications we'll find them in. We're focusing more on agricultural applications in this webinar. So just give you a little, you know, where we might find these things. I've got three separate applications listed here, pictures. Down here on the lower left, this is a water pumping station for a dairy farm. Uh, what we have here is a, uh, there's a large holding tank uh, that uh, holds, I forget how many thousand gallons of water. And, and then we've got a pump, we've actually got two pumps here. One's being used as a backup. There's only one that operates all the time here. But from the, from the tank, we've got the water coming in and these pumps are pumping to the entire farm. So we're supplying pressurized water to the dairy farm um, all the livestock waters uh, on this particular dairy farm, there's actually two different parlors, um, washing systems, things like that. So we're supplying 50 PSI water in this line to the dairy farm. And that demand is constantly changing depending on, you know, the wash cycles and maybe the livestock waters. We're constantly using water, not using water, so the pressures would generally constantly always be going up or down. Well, this application, because we're using a variable speed drive, uh, we have it dialed into 50 PSI, so we're able to maintain 50 PSI plus or minus 1 PSI on this line at all times. That particular pump is ramping up and ramping down to maintain our PSI. So that's one application we see quite often. Uh, in the center, we have another application we see on uh, a lot of animal housing units. This is an actual 72-inch uh, ventilation fan, has a three-horsepower motor. There's several of them in this facility, but this is, picture of, this is a picture of just one of those. And the way that this one is configured, this has a variable frequency drive that controls the speed of the fan. Um, it's actually set up based on temperature. So depending on the temperature, we'll determine what RPM or what speed that fan runs at. At about, I think this one was configured at 60 degrees Fahrenheit. The fan actually started to turn on at a minimum RPM. And then as temperature increased, RPM increased, they believe at 80, 80 degrees Fahrenheit is when this particular fan was running at 100% RPM. And then anything beyond that, um, anything beyond that, then we are running at full on 100% RPM. And then, of course, vice versa, as temperature drops, um, that VFD will actually control that fan, bring that RPM down until eventually um, it would automatically turn off. So it's very precise control. We can get what that what that animal needs for cooling. We can adjust it as needed, and uh, seems to work pretty effectively. 
On the right, this is a picture of an irrigation pumping plant. We actually have an electrical enclosure that houses the variable speed drive. Behind this would be the actual motor with the well pump. And in this particular application, we are actually controlling two different irrigation systems, pivot systems. Each one of the pivot systems has a different gallon per minute and PSI requirement. So what we're able to do here is use a pressure sensor and uh, some, some other logic to determine which PSI is actually, which irrigators being energized or needing to be on. And we can adjust our uh, speed of our well pump accordingly. So as, hey, as Gary, the demand increases. We've got a question. Yes. Will the VFD control an existing motor or do we need a new motor with a VFD? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, it depends. <laughs> uh, typically, if if you have a single phase motor, um, you would have to change that. Um, you would have to change the electric motor to a three phase motor. A variable frequency drive will not operate a single phase um, electric motor. However, uh, if you currently have a three phase electric motor a VFD does have the capability to control that motor. So I hope that answers the question. In that case, we would not have to, te technically we would not have to change that. Technically we would not have to change that motor. Hope that answers the question. Um, so yeah, I, back to the irrigation system here. Uh, I think I made my point with uh, multiple irrigators and depending on what the producers operating at the time would uh, determine what, you know, what PSI flow rates are required and that VFD can adjust that pump accordingly. Gary, can a VFD control any three-phase motor? What if it's really old? Well, that's another question. They do have... Um, there are new uh, inverter duty motors on the market, and I, the way I understand that, um, you know, you might want to check with check with the manufacturer of that particular motor to find out if it's not a newer style motor that might be inverter rated. Check with them. The inverter rated, the inverter duty motors. But with my understanding, is that the electrical windings are a little bit more robust to handle the reduced RPM loads. And um, in that case, those are rated, but the, the older ones, usually I've seen, my experience shows that we don't generally have problems, but it would always be a good idea to check with the manufacturer to make sure that that motor would work with the VFD. So we start talking about some of the advantages here. Uh, I discussed briefly already some of the energy conservation stuff. We'll get into details there. Lower system maintenance, and that brings up the point with the fact that they act sort of as a soft starter, which essentially means that they, <clears throat> instead of starting an electric motor across the line, you know, from zero to 100 percent almost instantly, um, the VFD inherently is more gradual ramp up time, which in turn reduces the mechanical stresses on whatever this motor would be connected to. So there's an opportunity there for some lower system maintenance depending on the application. Precise control, I talked about that using feedback loops and some automation control. We can really fine tune these things and, and get really good accurate um, control. Phase conversion, this is for going from a single phase um, to a three phase, and this is a big one in the rural areas that we often come across. We've got, um, you know, in some of the rural areas, we may not have access to three phase power. So uh, we have seen, you know, these VFDs operate on single phase power, but yet they can still control a three phase motor. Bypass capability, this comes from the fact that. Um, they're fairly easily bypassed. If there was a problem with the variable speed drive, that doesn't necessarily mean that we wouldn't be able to operate our machinery. We could just bypass the VFD and still be able to operate. So that's definitely an advantage here to consider. 
then we've got some disadvantages. Disadvantages would uh, uh, one of the one of the big disadvantages, I guess, or one of the problems that we you seem to run into once in a while is power quality issues, and that comes from the fact that there's uh, fairly sensitive electronic components built in within whenever we use a BFD. We've got uh, sensors and some you know control wiring and low voltage wiring, things like that that are very can be very sensitive um, to any kind of EMI, electromagnetic interference, or any kind of electrical interference that way. So that's that could be an issue if not dealt with. Uh, harmonics is another one. Uh, we do have an issue with the switching. I discussed the switching from those transistor, transistors within the VFD itself actually cause harmonic harmonics on the voltage line. And the biggie there, uh, just you know, check with the manufacturer. There's ways around it by using filters, and there's ways to mitigate that problem if dealt with up front. So usually electricians will will deal with that. And then um, motor cooling problems could be another disadvantage. We do have because we're running at lower RPMs. There's a chance that uh, the fan within the within the motor will not necessarily be able to keep that electric motor cool enough. So that may be an issue in complexity. Uh, unless you're familiar with the technology and you know familiar with you know how these things operate and, and what how to diagnose them, uh, if you don't have somebody trained uh, to work on that, it, it could definitely be a, a potential disadvantage. Taking a break here, just kind of a fun fact for everyone. I found this actually uh, yesterday. Uh, thought it'd be kind of interesting to show relating to dairy farms specifically, but the average dairy farm uses, or average cow uses 800 to 1200 kWh a year per cow. I kind of equated that to our family of four here in our home. We use less than that a month. So for what a cow uses in a year, we use uh, slightly less than that per month. So I thought that was kind of interesting. Digging into the different types of savings potentials here, and really there's basically three different types of motor loads that we encounter. Uh, one is variable torque load, the second is a constant torque load, and the third is the constant horsepower load. The variable torque loads offer the greatest energy savings opportunities um, due to what are called the affinity laws. Uh, which basically says that horsepower varies as a cube of the speed. These things, uh, these types of you know, example of here would be any kind of a centrifugal pump fan application here. These, those are the kinds of opportunities that really, uh, more than likely, would have a uh, the greatest energy savings opportunity for us. The second uh, constant torque load. This one is uh, more of a linear relationship. Uh, and that horsepower varies directly with the speed. So essentially a 50% reduction in speed will result in a 50% reduction in power required. Uh, we do see some applications here where we can get some savings uh, depending on you know whether or not automation can be used and, and, and what are we actually controlling to. But some examples of these sorts of loads would be conveyors, cranes, compressors, augers, positive displacement blowers, um, the PD blowers we actually see on dairy farms quite often here, and, uh, and we can get savings from that. Savings is possible. The constant horsepower loads; these are a little different, odd ones. I've not dealt with these, uh, but uh, these are more. It sounds like your machining type of tools, where horsepower does not change with the speed. So even if you're running at 10% um, speed, you would still have the same horsepower requirement. And in these applications, a BFD would not make sense because there would be no savings. To expand on variable torque loads, uh, one of the things here with pumps and fans is they're often throttled. And uh, by that, I mean manually throttled on Hi, fans. Hi, Gary. Um, I got a question for you. Uh, are you familiar okay. with oil, oil field pump jacks? The load will be substantially less less on the downstroke or even negative. Have you seen VFDs used there? I have heard of that, but I've never seen it. Um, 
but um, yeah, I'm not familiar. I'm not familiar with that particular application, but I have, I have heard of, I've heard of that. Yeah, with those jacks going up and down, um, there's kind of some uh, differences there. But I'm, I'm not familiar with that particular application. So, <clears throat> yeah, I was talking about the variable torque loads here being manually throttled. Um, on pumps, we might have some outlet valves or some gate valves might be redirecting. You know, if we're pumping too much water, we might manually control that. Or fans, sometimes they have inlet or outlet dampers to control our CFM coming out of our fan. I've got this picture here. This is a, actually an irrigation audit that I originally or recently have completed here. And this is a little bit of an interesting scenario, but uh, this is a irrigation pumping system, pumping plant. Um, there is a, uh, I believe it's a 125 horsepower well pump here, vertical well pump. Uh, well, well depths right around that two, three hundred foot range, and he's he's pumping out to an irrigation system. And the kind of the issue here is the fact that the uh, the well is not able to recharge. Um, to the point that it it had been originally when it was drilled, so we're not getting the flow rates out of it. So he this produce this actual producer was having a problem with pump cavitation, which um, actually is when the pump uh, instead of pumping water starts to pump air, which is can be very very bad for the pump itself. So producers will generally do whatever they can to avoid that um, cavitation problem. So in this particular case, what 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 was happening here? is the producer is putting a back pressure on the pump by closing that gate valve, which I've got circled here. So the system required, I think, 30 PSI of pressure, but because of the cavitation problem and the need to reduce the flow rate from that particular pump, um, the producer used a gate valve and actually put a back pressure on this pump of 60 PSI. So instead of running at 30 PSI, we're running at 60 PSI just to avoid the cavitation. So there might be an opportunity here um, for him to conserve by reducing the speed of that pump to avoid cavitation rather than using a manually controlled valve. Uh, I mentioned the affinity laws and, and kind of why pumps and fans offer the greatest energy savings opportunities here. We've got... Uh, <clears throat> Uh, it's due to the, what, it, what are called the affinity laws. And it, what it is, is it's a relationship between the power and the speed. Uh, the affinity laws basically have three different parts, one being flow is proportional to the speed, pressure is proportional to the square of the speed, and power is proportional to the cube of the speed. Uh, that's the biggie. Power is proportional to the cube of the speed. And mathematically here I've got shown in this table, how that works out mathematically and why that why that means what it does and why we always say these are the applications that you know offer the greatest energy savings opportunities we've got uh, you know mathematically I've done it to, to show here 100 percent rpm obviously we're not going to see any energy savings we're running at 100 percent however uh, let's let's say that we reduce our speed to 80 percent now, mathematically, when we take power as proportional to the cube of the speed, 49% energy savings. So that's a significant drop. Just by reducing RPM 20%, we can we can get a 49% energy savings out of that. Uh, we go down 50% speed, we're looking at 88% energy savings. Well, this is theoretical. Um, this is if you do the math. Things start changing when we reduce our speeds. We don't quite get that level of energy savings. Um, a lot of it has to do with the fact that when we start reducing our APMs on a motor, the motors themselves don't become, don't maintain that efficiency rating. But um, that is, and this gives you a good idea of the impact, you know, with pumps and fans and variable torque loads, you know, what, what we can what we can achieve here for energy savings. Here's a more or less of a graphical representation of the same thing. Uh, pay attention to the green lines, uh, more of an exponential curve, if you will. It's not a linear, but if you pay attention to the green line, 
what we've got here is more or less a relationship between power and speed um, for both a fan and a pump. If we look at the pump curve here, we can definitely see a difference. We'll just start up here at 100% speed, and we'll follow that across. We can see we got 100% power, obviously. But once we start bringing that down, say we might bring it back to 60% speed, now we're at about a 20% power. So it's it's more of a graphical representation of the table I had in the in the previous slide. We can definitely see the impact there. Constant torque loads. These are loads that we find on um, you know agricultural facilities quite often. Um, energy savings definitely is possible depending on the application and whether or not we actually we can control um, use a control network to be able to maintain a speed only to meet our demand. Uh, these kinds of loads, constant torque loads, you got to remember power is power and speed are directly related. So instead of having that exponential curve, we just have a straight curve, a straight line. We have a 50% reduction in power equals a 50% reduction in, I'm sorry, a 50% reduction in speed, 50% reduction in power. Uh, so we can see here um, this lower one, we got an air compressor. We do see some types of air compressors on the market that are controlled by BFDs. You don't see a lot of them, but some some certain types of air compressors are. Uh, variable speed drives on the vacuum pump is a big one, especially on dairy facilities here. Um, that That's actually a positive displacement bore, which technically is a constant torque load. But these systems are designed, you know, by the milking milking supplier to their size accordingly to be able to meet the maximum demand. So the maximum demand in a dairy facility is during the wash cycle, not during the milking cycle. So and the wash cycle is only a portion of the time that this motor actually operates. The majority of the time is during the milking cycle when we may only need 40% or 50% of the vacuum. So here we do see a lot of times we can serve quite a bit of energy by installing variable speed drive, variable frequency drive um, to bring that RPM and that motor down during our milking cycle so that we can conserve energy. I bring this up. Uh, some folks might be aware, some folks might not, but really when we talk about energy using using these VFDs and, 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 and using them on motors and uh, we're looking for automation. You know, if we need to be able to try to automate this process to conserve energy, because we know the motors are sized accordingly to meet our maximum demand. We don't always meet our demand. So here's a here's kind of a little diagram I put together to kind of show how automation works. You know, what we're trying to do. We have our motor tied to our load, whether it be a pump fan. On the right hand side, I've got a picture. This is actually another water pumping station. Um, supplying pressurized water to the farm from a holding tank. Uh, we've got our sensor or gauge. You know, I've got a gauge here, but that should represent the pressure sensor, which I've got circled here. So we've got, you know, water coming out. Um, pressure sensor monitoring that pressure. We tie that back to a controller. A uh, controller would sense a deviation from the actual PSI, uh, figure out you know, what it needs to do, what it needs to tell that variable speed drive, whether or not it needs to tell that VFD to increase speed or decrease speed to meet our demand. So if we deviate much from that, it's going to start making changes accordingly. And the VFD is simply there to control the speed of that pump. So if the controller is telling it, hey, I'm, I'm running a little bit too high a pressure, it will tell that VFD to decrease speed, vice versa, run too low a pressure, hey, ramp up, I need to increase speed. So that's that's kind of the whole idea here is to automate the process. When we're looking for cost effective opportunities, uh, especially you know when we start when we're doing energy analysis here on different facilities and we're looking around talking with producers, trying to find out you know what's going on, how is the system operating. Different things we look for, obviously your higher horsepower applications are you know, could be something to really target higher horsepower, more energy savings opportunities. Variable torque loads, I talked about that. Your pumps and fans um, offer the greatest energy savings opportunities. High hours of operation. Obviously, the more the motor operates, the more it costs to operate that motor. So there, there may be an opportunity there. 
high utility rates, the higher you have to pay for your electricity um, or energy, the, the, the greater incentive there is to actually decrease your usage. And then obviously, uh, you know, there might be some utility re rebate programs available to help offset the cost. And uh, specific to farms, there might also be some federal programs um, offering to help offset the cost. I know the NRCS has EQIP program, which in some states will offer incentives for variable speed drives or variable frequency drives as well. So for producers considering an upgrade, we want to determine the type of load that the motor is connected to. Um, is it uh, you know, variable constant um, torque? What kind of load? What are we connected to? We, we, we want to know that. We want to know if the application might be being throttled right now. I Meaning, are we controlling it with the gate? Are we back pressuring? Are we, you know, is there something going on there where we're, we're over pumping? Um, we want to consider that. Any avoided costs? You know, are there any kind of costs that we can avoid for any maybe maintenance issues, or is there anything that we can uh, avoid that way? Do we uh, we want to know what the cost would be to install a VFD, and these prices are across the board. Um, but uh, you know, work with a supplier, work with an electrician, uh, work with you know you know a company that can uh, specializes in this, and get some good cost estimates put together for you. And then obviously we want to be able to determine what the return on investment is. So for that we would have to determine you know what our energy savings. Uh, might be from installing that VFD. Determine that energy savings. There is a website out there that does a real good job, especially with pumps and fans, to give you a good idea of what the savings might be. Uh, it's the Department of Energy website. I've got the website listed here below. This EC Center, ecenter.e.doe.gov. Uh, it's a, a it's a downloadable kind of a uh, program that you can. You can enter in some of your motor specifications, um, efficiency ratings, load factors, horsepower. Get that off the nameplate of the motor. You configure it. Uh, it'll ask you, you know, what kind of a pump it is, what kind of a fan it is. You can, you can really detail it down, pretty detailed. Uh, tell it kind of what the hours of operation uh, are for that particular application. Uh, what kind of control method is being used currently. You know, if it's a bypass valve or a gate valve or, or something like that in the damper, um, tell it that. Uh, enter in your cost for your KWH, and it will give you a good idea of what the existing energy consumption is of that application and provide any kind of uh, energy savings opportunities. You know, kind of detail about what the potential energy savings may be and obviously give you a cost savings. So if you have the cost savings, you know what your, your cost of the equipment would be, you can pretty easily determine the return on investment. Here's an example, uh, another VFD vacuum pump. This, so we'll walk through this one. Again, this is a constant torque load. Uh, we're looking at the 50% reduction, 50% reduction in energy use. Here we've got uh, pumping hours uh, this particular farm, this is just an example I put together, but we can say that the farm milks three hours per milking, uh, one and a half hours per day for the wash cycles, so and three milkings per day. So in, in total, we're looking at about 4,900 hours per year operation on this particular motor application. Uh, we can figure that with our annual <coughs> KWH. We can figure out our KWH based on the the horsepower and load factor efficiency of our motor. Here we, we estimate 11.1 kW is what that pump motor pulls. So we figure about 54,700 kWh per year. Now, knowing that, and we know the utility cost of 11 cents per kilowatt hour, we can estimate that the annual cost to operate that pump is about $6,000 a year. If we assume that a VFD will bring down that <clears throat> Um, the energy required in half, which is pretty typical, um, anywhere from 50 to 60 percent, I guess I would I would say, generally is what we see. Um, but if we figure in 50 percent, we're looking at about $3,000 a year annual savings <clears throat> to this particular farm. We got a VFD upgrade of $5,000, spec'd out by a, a contractor. Uh, with that, we know there's less than a two-year payback. 
and that doesn't assume that there that there would be any utility rebates out there. So this is definitely a good opportunity. Here's a case study. I know this was a and this is the reason I use this case study is because it's a smaller dairy farm. It's only a 78 cow milking dairy here in Luxembourg, Wisconsin. They, they had asked us a while back in 2012 to come out and do an analysis of their farm, see if there may be any opportunities. And we actually found two VFD opportunities for this particular dairy farm. Uh, we found a VFD opportunity for a milk transfer pump and a VFD on the vacuum pump. The VFD on the milk transfer pump doesn't supply all the energy savings just from operating the pump. It's a little different in that we're actually controlling the flow of milk through a uh, milk cooling system, which allows the milk cooling system to operate more efficiently. So a majority of our energy savings in this particular application comes from that fact. But regardless, there will be some savings just on the actual pumping uh, portion of it as well. But here in the table below, we can see our annual savings there for each project you know, what the simple payback was for each one of those projects and our carbon offset. And we know that this producer actually followed through and, and, and took our recommendations and completed the project and was very satisfied overall. So that's it for my webinar here. Um, I hope I was able to get some points across and, and kind of explain what we look for and, and how we, how we and what we look for on farms and how VFDs can be used on, 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 in some of the more or less agricultural applications here uh, to help conserve energy. Uh, and also hopefully you take uh, maybe that Department of Energy tool and, and kind of take a look at that and determine and maybe you know of an example that you might be able to uh, sort of play around with and, and see maybe what the energy savings might be. And, and, and go somewhere with that. But uh, with that said, I guess, uh, Julie, I'm, I'm finished up here, so 